Good morning, Grace people. Good to be with you today on this brisk winter morning as we step into the new year. It is a new year here at Community of Grace, and for some of you, this may be a new place for you. If you are new to our congregation, we would love to get to know you better. There's a couple ways that we can do that. First of all, you may see a card in front of you in the pew that says new here with a little barcode attached to it. You can scan that in on your phone, and that will help you to connect further with us as a congregation. Also, please stop by the orange wall and visit with our connections and service coordinator, Hanukkah. Collins, as well as others who are there to greet you and start your journey with us here at Community of Grace. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Would you please stand this morning as we lift our voices in praise to God. As we come together now in worship, we come knowing our need and our need for God's forgiveness in our lives. That's why we come confessing and receiving his forgiveness from us today. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 1 John chapter 1 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in this promise from God, let's take a moment now to silently confess our sins before the Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy sent his son Jesus to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. In the authority of scripture and by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I tell you by his promise what you have confessed 
has been forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our service, lifting our voices in our hymn of praise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this new year, we know it is a new opportunity. We understand, Lord, that it is merely the changing of a calendar from one year to the next. But, Lord, you see into those moments in our lives, and you meet us in them. Father, we know that many look to the past year with sorrow as well as with joy, as each day brings its own sources of those things into our lives. Father, I pray that for those who are mourning right now, who are remembering 2022 as a place of challenge or of loss, that you would meet them with your comfort, with your love, with your consolation, to heal those wounds that may have come from that year, to bring joy in the memories of those whom they have known and loved. And Father, for those who rejoice in the new things that came in 2022, Lord, we rejoice with them. As you call us, Lord, would you bring grace into those moments as well. Father, as we look into the new year, Lord, with new opportunities and with new realities, Lord, we continue to lift up in this nation our leaders, our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court, Lord, as well as local leaders and officials in our state, Lord, our governor and legislature, and local mayors and leaders, of communities around us, Lord. Would you give them wisdom as they lead and guide them in your righteousness? Father, we pray for all of those first responders, Lord, as well as those who serve within the medical community as doctors and surgeons. Lord, would you give them grace in this new year? Would you give them rest, Lord, and renewed energy and sense of purpose in you? Father, we thank you for each family that is represented in this house, Lord. 
Would you help knit us together, Jesus, by your grace into the kind of family that only you supernaturally can make us? And Lord, would you open wide the gates of your mercy that many others may come to know you and your grace and your forgiveness and your purpose in life in this new year. Lord, help us to be a sign of that grace and help us to see grace in every corner of our community by your word, by your will at work in our lives. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. The reading for today is from Psalm 66, verses 1 through 5. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. Here ends the reading. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel reading comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. Rather long reading, so I'll let you know. If you need to sit, you're welcome to sit at any time. <laughs> Beginning at verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look! the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard, that John, who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. We send the children at this time to go off for their education, to grow and to learn and to be loved and know of Jesus. God bless you as you go. Well, Happy New Year, friends. There we go. Good. You can give the liturgical response and also with you. Yes. <laughs> as we begin the new year, we continue 
on our sermon series that began all the way back in September, our Route 66 journey, a journey through the grand story and narrative of the Bible. And we have covered a lot of ground since last September. As a matter of fact, we've covered the entire Old Testament, not in detail, but we've made our way through many of the great stories and great characters of the Old Testament to lead us into this big picture. But I will say this, if you're just joining us today, that's okay. It's really all right. There are ways for you to go back and look at some of those sermons from the past. But more importantly, I want you to know this because I know this for certain. Jesus will meet you wherever you are on your journey. I can say this confidently for three reasons. Number one, I have seen this in my own journey time and time again in the good times and the bad times, on the mountaintops and in the valleys. Jesus has always met me there. From the young days of being in that United Methodist Church, growing up singing next to my father, to the day that my sister decided to say, come and see, and brought me with her to a small gathering of Christians down at the University of Minnesota, to the day that I joined a worship team at a small, independent, non-denominational church in North Minneapolis. In each one of those places and times, God has met me. God will meet you on the journey, too. Because I have also witnessed it in the journeys of hundreds of people who I have known. People sitting in the pews here today. People who have gone on to their reward. People in past congregations who I have served again and again and again. I have watched as no matter where it is that someone was in their life journey, when God revealed himself to them, it was right in that moment. It was right in that place. Whether it was a good day or a bad day, a day of celebration, a day of mourning, God meets his people in their places on their journey. And Jesus certainly does that as well. And I can also see it clearly in today's reading from John's Gospel. We're going to be diving into the Gospel of John throughout this year. We've been making reference to it, making those connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament during the fall. And now we come into the gospel story, the story of Jesus. Makes sense, right? We just celebrated Christmas and his birth, and now we come into his story. But I want to let you know a little bit about the gospel of John as we step into this part of the story. It was written by the Apostle John, who is also responsible for writing three letters in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, creative writing, I know. And then the book of Revelation, also the revelation of St. John. Each one of those are powerful testaments to the power and work of Jesus in the life of John. And we're grateful for that. Now, the Gospel of John was likely the last of the four Gospels written. And it stands alone and has some very unique things about it. First of all, the language of it is unique. All four Gospels were written in Greek, but the kind of Greek that gets used in the Gospel of John is just a little bit different. It has a different flavor to it. That doesn't necessarily come through all the time in the English translation, but it's there, and it's true, and it's interesting. Not only the language, but the content. There are things found in John that aren't found in any of the other Gospels. It's because I believe there was something deeply personal about this Gospel. John, who would call himself within his own gospel, the apostle whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I believe that Jesus loved all of his disciples, but there certainly is a unique relationship there between John and and Jesus, as Jesus even hands his mother over into John's care at his crucifixion. There's a connection there that is so very, very important And you'll also notice that there's no birth narrative in the Gospel of John. We don't hear a story of Bethlehem or of a journey from Nazareth. We we don't hear a a story of of a stable or of a manger. Any of those features show up. Instead, we are introduced to the Word of God, the Word who became flesh, the one who stands outside, above, and transcends time and space. 
It's an important view of Christ and one that we should embrace as we make our way through this gospel. John wants to make a point that regardless of where Jesus was from, he is the son of God. He is son of man. He is truly the Messiah. And that while those links and histories that we see in the, narr- in the narratives of the, the synoptic gospels, as they're called, are very important and wonderful, there's something different and rich about the way John approaches Jesus and wants the story to be told. And as we step into the story today, we see where this story begins. It begins with John as a disciple, but not as a disciple of Jesus. He is a disciple of another John, John the Baptist. Don't get all the Johns confused because there's a lot of them. But he is a disciple of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist also stands alone amongst the prophets. That's who Jesus refers to him as. The last, really, of the Old Testament prophets. The one who transitions from the old to the new. The one who who brings a sense of urgency in preparation for the arrival of Jesus. The one whom all the other prophets foretold. John gets to be the prophet who gets to witness it first hand the messiah arriving an important position for sure to be able to identify who this jesus is to recognize and know why he has come and to make it declared boldly and clearly to everyone around him i am not the messiah there he is look behold the lamb of god important words from john john who has his disciples, including John the Apostle. And it says that as they make this connection, two disciples of John immediately leave John and go to follow Jesus. And John's okay with this. John speaks at another time saying that he must decrease, that Jesus might increase. He recognizes the significance And these two disciples, one named Andrew, and one that isn't named right there in the first chapter, it's just the other disciple, but we likely believe it to be John himself, not wanting to say his own name within this gospel. But it's Andrew and John, and they immediately start following this Jesus as they see him. And as they're walking down the road for a bit, Jesus realizes he is being followed turns and looks back to Andrew and John and asks them a question. What do you want? What a profound question. This is the Lord creator of the universe who looks to these two disciples of John and says, what do you want? And John and Andrew have a particular response. Their response is, where are you staying? Because we would like to stay with you. Their response is another question of Jesus. What do you want? We want to know where you're staying so that we can come and stay with you. That word stay is the same root of the word abide. And as you'll come to know and will come to discover throughout the gospel of John, abiding with Jesus is an important thing. To be where Jesus is. They don't just want to see what his living quarters are like. They say, we want to stay with you. We want to be where you are, Jesus, and learn about you and discover who it is that you are and what it is that you have come to do. So they follow him and they go to stay with him. And after spending a day with him, can you imagine spending a full day with Jesus? Just the two of you along with Jesus? Right after that, Andrew says, there's more people who got to know this Jesus, starting with his brother. And he goes off to find his brother, Simon. And he says, Simon, you have got to come and see this Jesus and meet him And learn of who he is. And so Simon comes to Jesus. And Simon doesn't say a question out loud. 
But I think there's an internal question for Simon. And that question is, who am I to you, Jesus? If you are truly this Messiah, this one sent by God, the one we've been waiting, then who am I? An important question of identity. Just trying to understand who he is. And that's where Jesus looks at him and says, Ah, Simon, I'm going to call you something else. I'm going to call you Peter, which means rock. And that, of course, will come to mean new things to Peter as well. The foundation upon which Jesus would build his church. The declaration of Peter, which in the Gospel of John is actually the declaration of Andrew. He says, you are the Christ. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the Messiah. And on that declaration, Jesus looks at Peter and says, I'm going to name you. This will be your identity now. Peter. And they continue on into the next town. And there Jesus spies Philip. And Philip has nothing to say. Jesus looks at Philip and simply says, come on, follow me. Maybe Philip is more the introvert. But I have to imagine that somewhere in Philip there may be an internal question. Jesus says, follow me. What would the natural question be? Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are you going to lead me and us now? You've got a lovely little band of people who you are bringing with you, clearly calling them to follow you. Where are we going? Where is this journey going to take us Oh, if only he knew, would he have still gone along? But Jesus makes the invitation clear. Come and see. Come and see. And then from there, Philip brings Jesus to find Nathanael. Nathanael, who had been sitting under his tree enjoying the figs. By the way, that's a picture of the blessed life. Each person sitting under their own fig tree in the shade. This is the picture of the messianic age. There's Nathaniel living the dream. Until Philip comes to him and says, you need to come see this man. This son of Joseph from Nazareth. (laughs) And the great response of Nathaniel. Nazareth? What good could possibly come from Nazareth? You see, Nathaniel knows his Bible. He knows that the coming Messiah was not meant to come from Nazareth. There's no recognition anywhere of him coming from Nazareth. But again, John is making a point that yes, this Jesus was born, fulfilling the prophecy, born in Bethlehem. And he comes from a place called Nazareth, and he has a, an earthly father in the name of Joseph, but that is not his true origin. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man. And the picture he paints for Nathaniel is clear. Nathaniel, I saw you before. I've known you. I know who you are. And for Nathaniel, the question must be, What kind of Messiah is this who comes from Nazareth but sees me as I am before he ever knows me? Jesus finds each of his disciples right where they are, right on their journey, each with different personalities, different histories, different locations, each one of them. This should be an encouragement to us, friends, Once again, no matter where you are, Jesus will find you, reveal himself to you, and invite you to come and see, even before you are a disciple. Jesus takes that action. And Jesus asks this question, of course, of his disciples, what do you want? 
So what do you want, community of grace? What do you want, Chris? What do you want, Carol? What do you want this year? You may have a variety of different answers to that question. You may answer it with another question. What's going to happen to my family this year, Jesus? You may be wondering if you're going to see healing for you or for someone else who is close and dear to you. You might be wondering if you should stay with your current job or move on. You might be wondering if you're going to find deep friendship or even love in this new year. You might be wondering if you're going to find a greater sense of purpose. Those are all real wants and desires of human beings, and they are not outside the care and concern of God. But there is another way of asking this question that I believe is closer to what Jesus is really asking. And that's this. What do you want with Jesus? What do you want with Jesus? Now, it's important to distinguish this from what you want from Jesus. (laughs) We all have many things that we may want from Jesus, and there's nothing wrong with asking for those things. But if we live only in the realm of what do we want from Jesus, we can turn Jesus into a magic genie where we rub the Bible and expect him to pop out and answer our wishes. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is a journey with Jesus, one who invites you to come and follow. And then he asks you, what do you want with me? What do you want in life? What are you hoping for? You know, I asked a related question to my staff this past week, framed in something that I'm seeing as rather popular right now, which is, what is your word or maybe a phrase for the new year? I kind of like it. I think it's, I, it's preferable to me to, to coming up with a resolution. <laughs> Instead, it's what do you believe for this new year? What word might be God pointing you to in this new year? And I got a variety of different answers from my staff. Some were saying they wanted connection. I believe their word was connection for the year. For others, it was hope. It's a good word. Hope. Another, it was unity, a desire to see greater unity. All good words. Others weren't quite sure or hadn't had time to think about it yet or were dealing with some immediate needs that were more pressing right now. That's all good. It's all a part of our journey. For me, personally, the word that I feel the Lord has given me this year is favor. Now, favor is a tricky word. (laughs) I want more of God's favor in my life this year, but that doesn't mean I'm asking for things to be easy. After all, Mary found favor with God, and it took her to places she never could have anticipated. Yet still, this word sticks with me. Lord, may I find favor with you in whatever it is that that means, or whatever it is. It takes me or whatever it is it costs I just want to find your favor, Lord. So I'll ask you the question again. What do you want with Jesus this year? You see, here at CGLC, this question is a reflection of our mission, which is to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ. It's a reflection of our vision, which is to see grace in every corner of our community. And it's a reflection of one of our core values, which is to take and invite first and next steps with Jesus. All of those things come into focus here as we start off the new year. What do you want with Jesus this year? Our church, our community, is working hard to create opportunities to live out and live in to this question We are working on some discipleship pathways, some definitions, some groups, some service opportunities, and some events. But listen, our goal in offering each one of these things is not to fill your calendar with busyness or not to just check off another item on your list of doing good or I've I've met my Jesus quota for the month. Not at all. And it's not to guilt you into doing more for Jesus. No. 
and certainly not to compete or compare our church to other churches. Really? No. It's simply to echo Jesus' invitation to those first disciples. Come and see. Come and see what it is that God has for you. Maybe you've thought about it enough to go, I know what it is that I am hoping for in this new year. Maybe it's clear for you. Maybe you are one of those individuals who starts off the new year with some New Year's resolutions or or simply establishing some goals and some visions and, and you engage in prayer as you prepare yourself for this new year. That's wonderful. It's great. I encourage you. Keep it up. But back to that whole point of not comparing yourself to anybody else, you may hear yourself or be in this place here this morning saying, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm dealing with a lot of personal pain or disappointment. I'm still trying to sort it out. Lord, I just don't know. Friends, let me encourage you today, just as I did in the beginning. Jesus will find you and meet you wherever you are on your journey. If it's a journey that has just begun, welcome aboard. You're among friends who want to be family, to encourage you, to show you his love, to be honest with you, scars and all, that there are no perfect people in this place either. We are ordinary people following an extraordinary God. And this God, revealed to us in Jesus Christ, invites us to learn from him, to trust him, and to imitate him. And I promise you, you will never run out of things to discover about Jesus. He can handle every question and every doubt you bring him. And as you grow closer to him, he may have some questions for you too. Perhaps today you may be hearing a question of Jesus to you. What do you want with Jesus this year? What do you want with me this year, Lord? Jesus, what do you want with me? May we lay those questions openly and honestly before the Lord as we step in to everything that God has for us in this new year. It's going to be good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for guiding us, for teaching us, for leading us, and for calling us. Lord, thank you that those who sit in this room today, Lord, are from every different place in life, in different stages of life, with different dreams and hopes and desires, and certainly with different stories. But I thank you, Lord, that you come and meet each one right where they are. You are big enough, Lord, to meet each person individually on their journey. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would meet your people today, whether they're watching online, watching in this room, or over in the fellowship hall, wherever they are today, Lord, meet them, find them. Ask them to be on this journey with you and invite them to come and see. Help us to see, Lord. Help us to follow. Help us to learn, to trust, and to imitate you, Jesus, as we receive everything that you have given to us. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.
Let's confess together now our faith before the Lord in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I invite the ushers at this time to come and receive this morning's offering. If you are giving by check or in a physical way, you can place it into the plates as they pass them by. Also, if you would like to give digitally, that information is also in the pew in front of you. Go and gather that which is the Lord's. Well, friends, it's time to come and see the goodness of God and what he has provided for us at his table. Would you please stand? We remember that it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He was with his disciples. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup And he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup 
is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. As we remember these gifts and as we come to see the goodness of God, let's also remember the words that Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and receive that which God has given to you. You may be seated as the ushers direct you forward. Just a couple of quick notes to remind you. The ushers will direct you down the side aisles up to the front where you will be greeted with someone with a wafer of bread. If you do need a gluten-free option, we have those available. Simply let your server know. Then we will have somebody who will also be holding a tray of wine and grape juice. The grape juice is the lighter color of the two liquids. Once you have received that, place the empty cups into the aisle as you return back to your seats. All are welcome who are followers of Jesus Christ at his table.
face, and I'll do it with the microphone on too. <laughs> God bless you. Well, friends, as I mentioned, we have next steps that we invite people to uh, take here at Community of Grace. First and next steps. I want to give you a few of them right now that are coming here as we come into the new year. First of all, faith mentoring training, a great opportunity to grow as a disciple of Jesus and to learn how to mentor others in the faith. There are two options for this class. Uh, it begins, uh, the, uh, you have a chance to do it on Sunday, the 15th, that's starting next Sunday, at 10.30 a.m., or Tuesday, the 17th, in the evening, and that is a Zoom class. And the, the content will be the same. One will be a virtual option, and then one an in-person option. Whichever one of those works for you, please consider stepping in. It's a three-session class. It's going to focus on the how-tos of becoming a faith mentor. There's going to be plenty of hands-on practice and application and role-playing, which is great. Uh, in addition, you'll be practicing starting a mentoring relationship, the mentoring process, and much more. You can sign up online or at the information desk to let the leadership know that you're going to be participating. Next, our annual meeting is coming up on Sunday, January 22nd. It begins at 11.45 in the Fellowship Hall. Everyone is welcome, though only members are able to cast a ballot. Uh, we do need a quorum of 100 people to conduct business, and the agenda is posted in the commons. Child care is provided in the community room for children up to 12. Uh, we'll be giving you an update. We did finish the year strong, thank you. Uh, but we want to give you uh, more specifics and details as the annual report comes out and as you also come and join us for that meeting, an important meeting for sure. And then finally, Tech Training Day. People of all ages have fascinations with technology. We have a lot of it that we use here at Community of Grace to help us put our services together on Sunday mornings and at other various times and various events. We would love to train you if you have an interest. We've scheduled a training. It is Saturday, January 28th from 8.15 to noon, okay? Now, you may think that Worship Tech is all about putting the services online, but there's a lot more to it. There are many elements for in-person worship that require accurately pressed buttons at the right time, and you can be trained to do this, and it would be a great blessing to us and to others who worship here. So join the team. Help us make worship services happen as well as other things here at Community of Grace. If you can reach out to our student ministries and worship associate Andrew Kelly if you'd like more information about that. Otherwise, just show up at 8.15 on January 28th, that Saturday. And then finally, remember to pick up the latest version of The Current so that you can stay current and also check out things online on our website at gracepeople.church. Well, friends, would you please stand now? Receive this blessing as we make our way out into the world. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon your life with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.